All right, so we have looked at the past two Sundays, uh, two lessons from uh, Malachi. And uh, when we think about the book of Malachi, at least up to this point, uh, it's, it's a book that's not been very positive at all. Uh, and, and again, as we've talked about, that's sometimes the nature of the prophets. A lot of times they had to do a lot of uh, problem solving or problem correcting uh, on the behalf of the people of Israel, at least getting that message to them. Well, when we think about Malachi chapter 3, we almost think about this as sort of the light at the end of the tunnel uh, type of chapter, at least in terms of uh, where we've been at. You know, we, we talked about beginning in Malachi chapter 1, and, and really, I'll, I'll preface everything by saying this. Hopefully, what you're getting from this, I know sometimes when we read through the, the books of the prophets or some of these Old Testament books, it can be easy for us to sort of, you know, especially by the time you get to Malachi, it feels like everything's repetitive over and over again. Hopefully, as you're thinking about this, if you go back and you read through the book of Malachi later on, perhaps if you read the Bible all the way through, when you come to the book of Malachi, hopefully these sermons are giving you at least something to think about as you're, as you're reading through it. Because Malachi chapter 1, essentially we talked about how that contained uh, really the, the problem of not meeting God's expectations. And as we noted in, for, the primary, for, for the primary part of chapter 2, uh, we discussed not just what happens when you fail to meet God's expectations, but the, the concept of spiritual failure, right? What is the outcome of not meeting his expectations? Well, in chapter 3, you're going to sort of again to be, uh, again to sort of see some positive or, or hope, we might could say, in this chapter because Malachi is going to talk about the, the task of overcoming spiritual failure. And that's really what our main concern is going to be this morning. I don't have all of the blanks on uh, that are on the handout on the screen, so I will go through and help you out. Uh, but first of all, we want to know that failure, a lot of times it should motivate us to, to pose questions. Failure should motivate us to, again, to pose questions. Uh, Malachi chapter 2, verse 17, you do see some questions that are posed in that verse. Uh, it says, Ye have wearied the Lord with your words, yet ye say, Wherein have we wearied him? When ye say, Every one that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delighteth in them. Or, Where is the God of judgment? So in that verse, you again, you see multiple questions. We're going to talk a little bit more about the, the concept of wearying the Lord towards the end of, towards the, end of the sermon this morning. Uh, but you have that, very, that, that question there at the end of verse 17 is what we want to look at. Uh, for the time being, again, where is the God of judgment? And we could almost picture that this is Malachi or those few righteous people that are at this point in Israel that are asking the question because they, like, this, like the song we sang before the lesson, or, or a couple of songs, or the, I believe the second song we sang, uh, we think about why do the wicked prosper, right? Why, do, why does it seem like God allows them to get away with those things? That's the question that's being asked because there are at least some righteous people that see Israel as a whole that is spiritually failing and they ask themselves that question where is the God of judgment and Malachi probably Malachi does want the the Israelites at least at this point that are failing to as we'll see in a moment to, to ask questions about themselves how can they overcome uh, how can they overcome the problem uh, and so what we want to look at this morning are really four points, I think, that Malachi brings out in Malachi chapter 3 about four steps, we could say, about how we can overcome spiritual failure. First of all, and I'll go ahead and put this on the screen uh, with the text there, uh, but we think about point number one. One of the lessons that we need to learn in order to overcome spiritual failure is that I must learn the lessons that come from failure. I must learn failure's lessons. And that's covered in verses 1 through 4. Uh, point number 2, for, uh, in verses 5 through 7, I must remember God's consistency when it comes to overcoming spiritual failure. The number 3, I simply must recognize wrongdoing. And that's presented for us in verses 7 through 12. And then finally, 
uh, verses 13 through 16, I must acknowledge God's capacity to hurt or his ability to be hurt by what I do. So in light of that, we'll look at Malachi chapter 3 and the verses that follow and, and think about as we look at this chapter, how can not just the people then, but how can I, if I find myself in a position where I am spiritually failing, how can I overcome that problem? So, first of all, I must recognize or I must learn failure's lessons. Sometimes it's been said that one of the best teachers is experience because with experience, you not only have success, but a lot of times what comes with experience is failure. And I have, uh, as some of you probably know, I, I've been cooking a lot recently. And I mean, obviously I'm still in a beginner stage to a large extent, but I, there were some things that I had to learn. Uh, there were some things that I failed at that caused me to learn more things about cooking, right? I understood that when it came to cooking uh, something, you would rather, at least in my opinion, you would rather undercook it first rather than overcook it. Because if you undercook it, you can always put it back in the oven. You can always throw it back on the grill and, and cook it to the proper temperature. You know, but if you overcook something, there's really not anything you can do about it. I uh, had that problem with bacon. That, that's one thing about me. Um, I generally like things well done, uh, except for a steak. But, but when it comes to bacon, I can't, I can't stand burnt bacon. Uh, it's one time I got sick off of it. But uh, I recognized when I first started cooking bacon, I had a tendency to leave it in a little bit too long. Uh, and, and I had to adjust the timing about how long I left it in. Uh, and anything that we do, uh, you, you can think about how failure is a great teacher. Uh, but one thing that we'll point out about a lesson that is learned from failure is that, first of all, failure is not inevitable. Failure is not inevitable. It's not predetermined. It's not, uh, it's not always going to happen. Right? It's, it's not like I'm always set up to fail, so to speak. Failure is not inevitable. And that's what Malachi gets across in verses 1 and 2. Failure is not inevitable. Uh, that, or, or the idea that you're not always going to be stuck in spiritual failure. Verses 1 and 2, this is a passage that we know is connected, uh, that is a messianic prophecy concerning uh, both John the Baptist and Jesus Christ. But verses 1 and 2, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he appeareth? So, when you think about messianic prophecies in the Old Testament, this is a, a general point that I think is pretty consistent throughout the Old Testament. Whenever you see prophecies mentioned about Christ, a lot of times that was done to inspire hope. That's exactly what Malachi is doing here. The children of Israel, based on verse 17 and, and everything that is follows, they were stuck in spiritual failure, but Malachi says there's about to be a time when somebody is coming, and obviously that being Jesus Christ, that gives hope because he offers the, uh, because through his death, through his blood, he offers the forgiveness, of, uh, the forgiveness of sins. And that's a point that Malachi is setting forth. Uh, that John the Baptist coming, he's preparing the way for him. Um, and, and certainly we can connect that with what happens in the New Testament with the coming of John the Baptist and with the life of Jesus Christ. So, this messianic prophecy is given to show that failure is not inevitable, right? And that's a very good thing to keep in mind. You know, sometimes we fail at things and uh, really there's no hope for us to be successful at them. Uh, I can think about for myself uh, when it comes to uh, medical stuff or uh, biology, things of that nature. Uh, I'm not nearly as good as my sister in those things. And if you ever had to put me to a test of, knowing about the parts of the body or knowing about what type of uh, procedure or what type of um, exercise is better for therapy, if you put me down next to my sister, I have no hope in terms of being smarter than her at that, right? Because obviously she's been trained in, to, to be able to do that. I don't necessarily have hope to be successful in that. And so 
that could be a very discouraging thing. But the point that Malachi is getting across here is that if you're stuck in spiritual failure, don't worry because there is hope that you can overcome the problem. And that comes through the form of Jesus Christ. And then he notes that point number two, that when it comes to not just the fact that failure is inevitable, but whenever we bring about or we, 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 desi- we decide to properly respond, the proper response to failure leads to improvement. And that's where we come to at the, in verse 2 as well. For he is like a refiner's fire and like a fuller's soap. Uh, verse 3, And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. And we've mentioned this before. You think about a refiner's fire. Its job is to remove, remove the purities, the impurities that are found within metals. Think about what soap does. Soap is there to cleanse uh, the body from uh, uh, sicknesses um, designed to, to, uh, to clean from germs and things of that nature. And so you've got this idea about uh, the improvement that comes from that. Verse 2, again, the question was, who may abide? Uh, to the day of his coming. It's not easy. Uh, And that's, uh, again, part of the message that's being extended here. Uh, Sometimes when it comes to learning from failure, you don't always have immediate success. It takes time. Uh, I know hopefully 20 years from now, my cooking skills are a lot better than where they are at now because success sometimes uh, comes with time. We certainly understand the concept that when it comes to failure of sin, as Peter would say in 1 Peter chapter 1 and 2 that the trying of our faith is precious. It's more precious than metals. It purifies us. Uh, and that's something that comes, from, uh, that, that comes from failure at times, right? Because I give in to temptation. I have problems with that. Uh, sometimes the temptations of, to sin are very trying to my faith. Sometimes I give in, but when I learn from those lessons and I get better, I better protect my heart not to give in to sin Uh, I become a better and a stronger Christian in light of that. And so even though failure is real, as we saw in chapter 2, it's not always inevitable. I can overcome that problem. And as verse 4 indicates, the offering uh, for them would be pleasant unto the Lord. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 22 reiterates really the same point where the writer there is talking about our position with Christ You know, after we have been obedient to Christ, we've overcome the problem of spiritual failure. He says, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So the removal of those impurities is something that we understand gives us hope that we can overcome spiritual failure. We continue to rely on the blood of Christ. As 1 John chapter 1 indicates, That's the same message that Malachi is getting across. If you want to know how you can overcome spiritual failure, think about the lessons that failure teaches us. Because in this particular light, there are some positive things that come from learning from the mistakes that we make. So verses 1 through 4, I must learn the the lessons that failure sometimes teaches. Verses 5 through 7, I have to remember God's consistency in the matter. Verse 5, it says... Uh, the, the text reads for us, I will come near to you to judgment, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers and against false swears and against those that oppress the hireling and his wages, the widow and the fatherless, and that turn aside the stranger from his right, and fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts. So under point number two, it's always important to remember, and as Malachi demonstrates here, that God does not lump the righteous in with the wicked. You can think about how that passage is often uh, illustrated throughout the Bible. Think about the story of Noah and the flood, right? Noah and his sons, his family, they were the only ones righteous on the earth is what the, the writer of Genesis records for us. And we know that in that particular case, God did not lump the righteous in with the wicked in terms of them being destroyed. They, uh, they as we know, built the ark and they, they preserved themselves. Uh, you think about the, the prophets themselves. You think about Malachi, right? Uh, Malachi, uh, even though he is living in a wicked Israel, and just as a lot of the other prophets did, they, uh, they, it, it's not like God stopped caring for them. You think about the prophet Elijah, right? And you think about how Elijah 
was so depressed that he, that he really, in a sense, wanted to, to kill himself. He thought he was the only one left that was righteous, and yet you see God's concern for him because God did not lump the righteous in with the wicked. Verse 5 is that same indication, right? Those, the picture here is really those that are wicked um, will face punishment. And, and that's really the response to the question that was asked in verse 17, where is the God of judgment? Well, verse 5, God says, I know you're righteous, talking to the righteous, and, and in light of that, don't be afraid because judgment comes to those that choose not to do righteousness. So God does not lump the righteous in with the wicked. And then verses 6 through 7, keep in mind that God holds a forgiving attitude. Verse 6, For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Even from the days of your fathers ye are gone away from mine ordinances and have and kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. And then we'll note the end of that in a moment. But you know, verse 6, for I am the Lord, I change not. Now that's the definition of consistency, right? Somebody who does not change. It's always tough dealing with people, probably, that have a tendency to not make up their mind on matters. Uh, it can be very frustrating to deal with people like that. Uh, but God points out that he does not change. And that points out his consistency. And what he is really telling to those that are willing to, to those that are righteous, those that are willing to repent, is that those that do not repent, they face judgment. But verse 6 and 7, I change not, therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. That is, you're not going to be destroyed like the wicked are. I continue to extend mercy. You think about how many occasions over and over again in the Old Testament where God had extended mercy to his people. We talked about, we talked about that a good number of times in 1 Samuel. right? How many times the Israelites, whether that was through... Uh, Eli the priest and his sons, and they had their wickedness, and yet you still see Samuel uh, that was there continuing to train to grow up and, and to learn from the Lord. You think about the example of Saul, and even though Saul began in a great positive state, we know that they're, they're, they're where we're at right now. Saul's lost favor with God. Didn't mean that Samuel lost favor with God. Even though Samuel's the guy that anointed Saul to be king, Samuel was a righteous man. God never forgot about that. He didn't want the righteous sin with the wicked. And God, even though Samuel was not perfect, God continued to offer mercy to him. Verse 7 again, Even from the days of your fathers, ye are gone away from mine ordinances and have not kept them. The important point being, return unto me and I will return unto you. A story that is consistent throughout the Old Testament. A willingness uh, a, a willingness for God to have a forgiving attitude. When we think about that for us as Christians, sometimes we might think that it seems like God wants us to fail, right? If we deal with a particular sin, if we deal with a particular temptation that, that seems overbearing, that seems overpowerful, it feels like sometimes God just wants us to fail because we keep dealing with that problem. Uh, but what we have a picture of here is that God does not want us to fail. He's willing to offer forgiveness. And you think about 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, uh, that there is no temptation that is given to man where God uh, does not expect us to be able to overcome that temptation. And so at times we may feel in our lives like sometimes it, that God wants us to fail, but the picture here that was given to the Israelites is that they're not stuck in failure, that God continues to offer forgiveness if you're willing to repent. And so in essence, God is consistent in that he does not want you to fail spiritually. In point number three, verses seven through twelve, I have to recognize wrongdoing. And first of all, this requires me to acknowledge that there is a problem. There is a problem that I that that perhaps I am dealing with this. Right? And God points this out. Verse seven. The, again, this is this would be what the Israelites would say, but ye said, Wherein shall we return? And the question that's being asked there is more so, what have we done that's wrong? Right? And, and, and the question for some, at least those that are not righteous, is they're going to ask the question, well, we haven't done anything wrong. At least for these Israelites, their standard of morality is, is not what it should be. So God poses a question, verse 8. Right? If you don't think you have done anything wrong, God says, Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? Well, in tithes and offerings. In the 
point being here, you can almost get a, you know, in, in a sense in your mind, we can't actually break into somebody's home. We can't break into God's home, right, and, and take his possessions, right? We can't go in and, you know, through a computer, uh, steal God's identity, take his credit card information, take money out of his bank account. We can't do that, right? But God points out, but you say, wherein have we robbed the tithes and offerings? And the point being is that, as we saw in chapter 1, the Israelites hadn't been giving what they should have been giving to God. Uh, and, and what the, the overall point that's, that's coming from this is that the Israelites needed to recognize that there was a problem with them, right? I, I, can't, I can't begin to have success if I'm not willing to acknowledge what I've done wrong in failure, right? And you think about any time that we fail in life, uh, we, we pose questions about it, but we, a lot of times we try to figure out what did we do wrong. Because we go back, we correct that mistake, we don't make it again, that way we are successful. That's really what God's getting across the Israelites here. Right? Look at what you've done wrong. Acknowledge that you have a problem. Verse 9, the end result of that problem, ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. And if I acknowledge that there is a problem, then I have the self-awareness to do something about it. Verse 10, if I've acknowledged that at least in the case of the Israelites here, if I haven't been giving like I should have been giving, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open to you the windows, windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there, shall, uh, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Right. So if I acknowledge a problem here, and I go back and I fix the mistake, and I and I don't repeat it, and I do that, which is successful, I'm going to benefit from that. James chapter 2 is the very same idea that Malachi is demonstrating here. James chapter 2 talks about how we look into a mirror to examine ourselves in light of what the Bible says. And if I see the impurities, if I see the flaws, if I recognize what I have done wrong, my responsibility is to go in to correct those problems, and that way I can begin to be successful spiritually. That's what the Israelites should do. Point number two under that, the blessings of righteousness are great. That's verses 11 and 12. I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field. Saith the Lord of hosts, and all nations shall call you blessed, for ye shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. And just briefly to sum that up, you, you have the picture again of maybe a, a field that is devastated, that shows no signs of life. God says if you're willing to repent, you correct your wrongdoing, uh, you're going to be like a, plen a, a bountiful field, a bountiful vineyard. And you will benefit from recognizing your wrongdoing. And then finally, verses 13 and 15, I have to acknowledge God's capacity to hurt. Now sometimes we forget that God has emotions, that he is affected by our actions in a way. We think about Again, the story of Noah, right? We read about how God repented or it, uh, that, that at least it motivated God to look at what was going on and he was sorrowful for the wickedness of man. Think about on occasions in the life of Jesus where Jesus became angry with certain individuals. Think about Jesus' capacity to hurt as well. Jesus wept with the death of Lazarus, who was a good friend of his. And what you have in verse 13 through 15 is a picture of God being hurt. Verse 13, your words have been harsh or stout against me, saith the Lord. Now you almost, you think about that, that phrase, sticks and stones may hurt my bones, but words will never hurt me. Well, in the case of God, words can hurt, at least it hurt him. Their problem is that, verse 13, what have we spoken so much against thee? What have we said to hurt your feelings is what the Israelites would pose to God. Well, God responds, ye have said it is vain to serve God. And what profit is it that we have kept his ordinance and that we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts? God is hurt because the Israelites have essentially said that he, uh, in a way that there was no benefit from serving him. Now, we think about the Israelites' role as, as the children of God. You know, parents, think about that with your own children. How much would it hurt to say that there was no benefit to doing what you said? There was no uh, benefit. Uh, think about this especially with a child that has grown up. 
Think about a child that, that is now about to move out and, and, and start their own life. And they think about that question and, and they ultimately come up to you and say, you know, you raised me, you taught me uh, to do uh, everything as you both would expect. You've uh, done everything to try to show me the way in which I, walked, I should walk as a Christian. And then they ultimately say within that, all of that was for nothing. It was worthless. It did me nothing to learn about Christ growing up. It did me nothing to look at your example that you set for me. As a parent, I think you would be pretty disappointed to hear your child say that God, in a way, is in that same way disappointed. The Israelites have said, you know, we have your law. You've told us what to do. But at the end of the day, it's pointless to follow what you say. It's pointless to think that we can benefit from doing what you've said. And God justly is hurt because of that. Verse 15, uh, and this indicates to us again, uh, verse 15, And now we call the proud happy, yea, that they that work wickedness are set up, yea, they that tempt God are even delivered. So everything's flipped on its head is the idea. The righteous are the ones suffering, the ones who are wicked are prospering. And so not a good picture but when it comes to failure, I do not want to fail because I know that it causes God to be disappointed. And verses 13 through 15, God's essentially telling the Israelites, you've hurt me with your words, and for that reason I am very disappointed in you. Something a child would not want to hear. But in light of what he says there, don't, let's not lose sight of the fact that Malachi chapter 3, you know, even, even though the things in verses 13 through 15 are pretty bad right now, if you think back to the beginning of the lesson, there is hope in overcoming spiritual failure. For us, we recognize that we rely on someone else. And, and as we draw to a close this morning, uh, the final point, in light of what Malachi says, Malachi would point out that when it comes to overcoming spiritual failure, it's not a solo task. Overcoming spiritual failure, it's not a solo task. The Israelites had the ability to rely on the consistency of God. Uh, the promise of hope that would come through Jesus Christ. We as Christians likewise recognize that when it comes to overcoming the problem of sin, it's not something that we should worry about having to do that alone. We have God saying consistent help that he had back then. We now recognize Jesus. We have the forgiveness of sin that comes through his blood. We have the opportunity to rely on the brothers and sisters in Christ that are also working towards the same goal to help us overcome the problem of sin. And in that way, we have hope that when it comes to sin, we're not always stuck in it. It's not inevitable. And that's the message that Malachi brought, that brings to the Israelites in Malachi chapter 3. That's the message that we have looked at this morning. Sin uh, is not something that we are stuck in. We can indeed have hope that we can overcome that problem. We know, of course, that we have to overcome it the right way. The Bible says that in order to be obedient to Jesus, we have to hear what God's Word says. We have to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, we have to repent of our sins, turning our lives to the better, that we confess Christ, willing to wear his name and, and to uh, live a life that defends his honor, and that we are ultimately baptized for the remission of our sins. And that way we do, like the Israelites that are being depicted here, when we stand before the Christ on the day of judgment, we have purified ourselves from iniquity through the blood of Jesus Christ. And then finally, if we have fallen away from God, we've been obedient to the gospel, we can indeed likewise have the blood of Christ wash our sins away again, not through baptism, but by the prayer for the forgiveness of those sins. This morning, if you have any need, won't you come while we stand and while we sing?